started. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank the candidates for coming. They have an extremely busy schedule right now, so we really appreciate that they could come for this debate. Um, I'd like to thank you, the residents, for making time to come as well, and um, local business people who are here as well. Um, so this event is hosted by RAMP Residents Association Mount Pleasant. And my name is Sandy Johal. I'm a board member of this newly incorporated society. Um, this event is held with no public or corporate funding. Um, the rental of this beautiful space um, has been paid for by our board members, um, as well as the food. And uh, I'd like to thank Our Town Cafe for donating the coffee. It was very generous of them. Um, we have a donation box at the front, so if you'd like to make a donation, that would be greatly appreciated. So now down to business. Um, in just four weeks, we are going to be having a crucial election in the city. Um, it could be a real turning point. With astronomically high real estate prices, low minimum wages, uh, visible lack of affordability and hence livability um, for the vast majority of Vancouverites, in addition to a lot of other pressing concerns and issues, there is growing unrest in Vancouver. Um, people aren't happy. And a lot of people I've spoken to have lost faith. And um, they've lost faith with city council for neglecting citizen input, um, breaking promises. And, you know, voter registration is low. So we want to have this event for you guys so you can see who these people are, what they stand for, um, you know, who will keep their promises, who will value citizen input and who will ultimately stand up for the communities in Vancouver. So this is a chance for you to put names to faces and get a sense of who you'll vote for in the November 19th election. Tonight's focus is only on uh, citywide planning processes. Uh, we want to keep it specific. Um, so we're looking at you know, how the city is changing, why and by whom. It's not specifically about Mount Pleasant tonight. Um, but we are feeling the effects of changes in policy around the city. Um, so this brings me to the plan for tonight. This will be a formal debate. So our invited panel consists of candidates from five different parties. And we'll start with four questions from our moderator, Ross Moster, uh, to each of the candidates in four rounds with the different candidates starting each round. Um, the candidates will have only 90 seconds to answer. And they haven't been given the questions in advance, so they'll be thinking on their feet tonight. Um, this will last for about an hour, and then um, we'll give a chance for any other council candidates in the audience to make any remarks, introduce themselves, and then hopefully around 8.30, 8.45, um, the panelists will take questions from the audience, so feel free to come up to the central mic here and ask a question. Um, again, these are questions, not public statements, so please make sure they are questions, and please ask questions that are direct, concise, and relevant to the topic. Um, we are looking again at planning issues across Vancouver that are affecting communities. Um, to keep things running smoothly, we might have to cut you off if your question is not direct and to the point. Um, we do have some paper in the back if you feel more comfortable writing out your question before you come up. And, um, We'll probably have time for about eight to ten audience questions, and then that's going to wrap up the formal part of the evening. And then from 9.30, 9.45 onwards, we'll give you a chance to just mix and mingle. Um, if candidates have time to stick around, you can talk to them directly face to face. Otherwise, you can meet the other people in your neighborhoods, in your community. Um, you can get to know each other. We have snacks in the back, so feel free to grab them at any time. Sorry, I'm not a professional MC. Um, and also, RAMP will be hosting a Neighbors Forum next Wednesday, um, November 2nd, at St. Pat's Parish Hall, Main and 13th, from 7 to 9. And this meeting will focus specifically on Mount Pleasant and issues in Mount Pleasant. So if you can make it, it would be great to see you. And uh, final words, we have restrooms to my right, uh, just down a couple of flights of stairs. But if you need one that's more accessible, there's one in the back to the left. Uh, please turn off your cell phones and any other devices you have. Um, we need you to keep your voices low if you're talking in the audience so that we can hear the candidates speak. And um, again, please respect everybody in this room. 
um, especially the candidates, and treat everyone in a neighborly way, no matter what the political views are. And uh, on our slogan on our website is, a city starts with a community we aim to keep ours alive. So with that, I'm just going to introduce the panel. So right here we have Jason LaMarche from NPA. He's a council candidate. And then moving on to Councillor Deal, who is a current council member with Vision Vancouver. And then we have uh, Elizabeth Murphy running with NSV. She's a council candidate. And then we have uh, Bill McCreary. He is also a council candidate running with MPA. And then we have Councillor Meggs, who is currently on the Vision Vancouver Council. And we have uh, council candidate Adrian Carr from the Green Party. And then last but not least, we have Councillor Ellen Wisworth, who is also on the council right now, and she's from COPE. So with that, I'll just quickly introduce our moderator, Ross Moster. Um, he has a 35-year background in small business, food justice, cooperatives, social and environmental activism, and sustainable, resilient community building. He's the founder and convener of Village Vancouver, a transition town initiative which helps neighbors to connect in community and create positive, tangible, local responses to issues such as climate change, peak oil and growing economic instability and inequity. He's also a member of the Vancouver Food Policy Council and the SPEC Car Free Vancouver, now BC Co-op and I don't know how to pronounce this, I'm but upon. I'm upon, I'm upon boards. Um, also just a quick comment, if you have any questions or concerns or you need some assistance, uh, please look for a ramp volunteer. We'll have these badges with our names and with our logo. So with that, I'll just pass the mic over to Ross, and we'll begin. Thank you, Ross. You're welcome. Maybe we'll Here I go. Yeah. I'm not technical. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay, good luck. Okay, I'd also like to like welcome everybody here tonight. And am I good? Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. I actually managed to lose my glasses, so I think there's some people out there, but maybe if you cough once in a while, I'll, I'll know you're still there. Uh, yeah, so I kind of want to just uh, jump right into it. Uh, we're actually going to do uh, five questions. I, um, because of my interest in food, I've snuck a question in about food, and that will be the last one. So, okay, so the first question, and we're going to do this... Uh, we're going to rotate the order. Uh, Ellen, you'll be answering the first question first, and then we'll just go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven down the line. And then the second question, we'll start with the uh, third speaker, and then we'll go down the line. So, okay, so the first question is high rise towers over 10 stories continue to expand from the downtown peninsula into Chinatown across False Creek and through every neighborhood all the way south to the Fraser River. Do you th think that these are the best ways to achieve density and affordability without impacting the scale, form, and character of the surrounding neighborhoods? And uh, what are some other ways that um, this could be achieved as well? Well, I... Sorry. Is it on? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think you know me well, uh, Council Ellen Woodsworth with COPE. Uh, if I look through this, I voted against most of these high rises, most of which are many of which have been spot rezonings before strong uh, enforceable area plans or the neighborhoods have been developed are in place. That has me very concerned. I fought hard to have area plans for Marple, for the West End, for downtown east side and Grandview Woodlands before these developments went through. I have tremendous respect for Jan Gal, who's wrote the book Cities for People, and what he said is that six stories are an ideal height to create neighborhood, to create community. I think we have to look, in fact, to what communities need and what Vancouver needs. And I think, number one, what Vancouver needs is real affordable housing, not affordability that's one, one third of your income if your income's at $3,000. Clearly, we need affordability for people who are in income assistance, seniors who are in pensions, students. We need real affordability. And I think, secondly, what we need is we need community amenities. Many of these developers are marketing their projects and pointing to community parks or community facilities that are already there, and they're not giving us the money that we need to fully fund either the amenity, amenities that are needed or the amenities that will be needed once this kind of density goes in. I think those are all serious concerns we need to talk about. 
And I think that means, I'm out of, does that mean I'm out of time? I'm not sure. Uh, yes. I mean, we need to look at what the, the regional growth strategy and see okay. what it, Move on to the it next works speaker. and what Car, running for council for the Green Party. Uh, first of all, it's it's so clear that there is a lot of unhappiness among citizens in this city, and it's mostly around the spot rezoning of extraordinarily dense development, high rises, way beyond the scale of local neighborhoods in various parts of this city. The first thing I want to say is almost every meeting I've gone to, uh, both in private and in the public meetings, people have said, look, there is a way to achieve density that is not related to just building high rises. The kinds of cities, and like Alan said, at six stories, the kinds of cities that we know and love in New York, Paris, London, many of the European cities have that scale of development, and it is so much more humane. Secondly, my opinion, you would not know this maybe, that I have my master's degree in urban geography from UBC, studying with Walter Hardwick and David Lake, a social geography program. Um, at that time, I learned very clearly uh, that there are tipping points in density. You can develop in a too dense way, and you lose social cohesion and the fabric of a community. And I think we need to take care of that issue. Thirdly, thirdly, those high rises don't mean affordability. That is an entirely different question, and it needs to be approached with a different set of policies and an incredible action plan, because we do not have an affordable city currently. Um, I believe that zoning should, uh, that, that development should fit within current zoning and should fit within current neighborhood character. Okay, Jeff, and just as a reminder, if there was an announcement, we have 90 seconds to answer each question. So I'll get question three, though, right? Or are we all doing one thing? Okay. We're all doing this. Okay, thanks very much, Ross. Will be, uh, my, my um, we've done many, many uh, decisions with council, and one of the things we've really been trying to do is make sure that we tackle the question of affordability, but it's a very intractable one, and prices keep rising. And we've approved uh, buildings at four stories, six, ten, and higher, depending on where they are and the location. So the, uh, the decisions that we've made in every case have tried to reflect some community needs and interests, and Chinatown had a strong call from the community to put in more density. I don't think anything would be over 10, notwithstanding that. I don't think that there's one answer, one size fits all. There may be a solution in some places that's best at four to six stories, and other places at six to 10, and I think there are parts of the city where it could be much higher. So uh, I believe that affordability is not generated necessarily by density. And we're going to need more work in the next term to try to find ways to put housing in place that beats the needs of the vast majority who aren't able to live in the city even though they work here. Uh, hi, I'm Bill McCreary of the NPA. I, uh, I have to beg to differ with my colleague, Mr. Uh, Drake, uh, sorry, Mr. Bates. Uh, in my opinion and experience, uh, it's really helpful if you start with a plan uh, and a, a neighborhood, uh, a set of neighborhood guidelines and a zoning bylaw, which is referred to in uh, the, this question, and you respect those guidelines. And if you want to change them, you do. You, there's a due process that you go through to change them. This city council has overridden those plans and is uh, just disregarding uh, not only the wishes and the uh, priorities and the values of the local communities, but the, in fact, the regulations themselves. The director of planning has the authority to override height and density, and there's they're bonusing projects sometimes five times higher. Uh, and I've been, in fact, there's one that went from this downtown is something like 21 or 22 FSR on a on a on an eight uh, FSR site or something like that. It's just ridiculous the the, the over over densification that's going on. And this, the city has is hooked on selling um, uh, density uh, to get money, uh, CAC money, uh, and and I, I I think we've got to change that process. It's it's the wrong values and it's it's giving us setting the wrong priorities, uh, and we're ending up with a, a very poorly uh, designed uh, and built city. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Elizabeth Murphy with Neighborhoods for Sustainable Vancouver. And over the last uh, four and a half years, I've been working.
person with many neighborhoods that have had numerous concerns, first under the MPA and now um, most of these policies are being further implemented through vision and just the assumption that it is necessary to rezone the entire city in order to meet future growth is, is actually false because the existing zone capacity is actually enormous in the city of Vancouver and those actual numbers, actually Ellen Woodsworth brought forward a motion at council trying to get the details of what the existing zone capacity of the city is and how much density is actually within our existing zoning that has not been built and uh, we still have not got that information from staff but the reality is that there is a lot and we need to first do an assessment of what we actually have, what we actually need to meet realistic growth expectations and not just take a cookie cutter approach across the city with the basically building forms that are most more suited to downtown than to other neighborhoods which may not be the most appropriate in, in those locations. And certainly putting towers in, in Chinatown and um, into the heritage districts is uh, very disruptive and, and um, detrimental. So thank you. Hi everyone, Heather Deal, Vision Vancouver. This city is driven almost entirely by the land values these days. Almost every decision we make, whether it's the announcements around artist studios that we made today, or how tall a building is going to be, is based on land values. And in the past, planning didn't take into account these skyrocketing values of land, we didn't know about it, didn't take into account climate change, and didn't take into account the incredible growth in population that this city has experienced. So when you layer all of those things on, you get a city where in some places it does make sense to build mid-rise, the ones that are in the currently existing zoning and allowed there. But in other places, nothing will ever be built under that because the land is too valued too high, it is not economical to build them. So that's one of the things that we have to take into consideration when you're governing and looking at these complex questions. We're also looking at transit. I'm actually very proud of the Canby Corridor planning where we said that the Canby Corridor has to densify because it is along one of the major transit routes in the city, a highly successful transit route. There are places that are four stories, there are places that are six stories, and there are places that are taller along the nodes along 41st, for instance, which is a big cross of other transit. Transit-oriented development is going to happen in the city, throughout the city, and there will be places where taller buildings occur. But it has to be sensible to the neighborhood. We know that. We are now instigating a new neighborhood planning process which will allow more time with neighborhoods so that we can have that consultation. But you can expect taller buildings along transit hubs and the land value drives whether or not shorter buildings get driven, built and that's why many don't get built. Jason. My name is Jason LaMarche. I'm an MPA City Council candidate and I'm a renter in the West End. Right now there is a clear challenge in Vancouver of how your input and feedback is gonna translate into meaningful outcomes and what the city does. I know in my community downtown, this has become a major issue where people have clearly expressed their preferences for what's coming into their neighborhoods and mayor and council are not listening. Um, not only that, there's a bit of a toxic culture in City Hall, which I would like to change moving forward. Uh, I'm wanting to engage people on these issues and really look at planning in Vancouver, understanding that we are a bit of a mosaic of 23 different communities. And like Jeff said, um, there are points where certain types of development will be better for different neighborhoods. And that's all reflective upon you and your homes and your communities. And the council needs to be a lot more open in using your feedback into what gets implemented in your community and to start showing some discretion in their decisions and not just defaulting every single time with the government of the day. Uh, I know that uh, incremental change is a great way to develop our communities, but when you look at the rental stock, for example, in the West End, that was through a lot of federal grants. We've lost these relationships with senior levels of government and Vancouver needs to be the leader in reestablishing these relationships so that we can set up a tax system to allow the development to move forward. Great, thank you. So for the next round, we're going to start with Jeff and then move on to Bill and uh, so on and so forth. And the second question is the uh, 
short-term incentives for rental, in other words, the STIR program implemented two years ago, offers subsidies to developers for building market rental housing. This program expires at the end of the year. Would you extend it? Thanks, Rick. Thanks very much, Ross. Uh, I uh, think that the STIR program has very, been a very exciting and innovative program, and it was intended to deliver on uh, Gregor Robertson's campaign promise to build rental housing in this town if we possibly could. It's been reviewed by a number of people, including the former president of the NPA, and they find that we've really done a good job of maximizing the regulatory changes and the incentives. So we've delivered hundreds and hundreds of units of additional rental housing, some at four stories, some at six stories, and some a bit higher. I would have liked to see even more. The project will be reviewed. I don't know what its final form will take. It expires at the end of this year, and I think that we do need to take action to provide housing. We can't subsidize the rents and make it lower than market rates, but we need to add to the rental supply for the 51% of our residents who rely on a rental. In the West End, it's 80%. Mr. McCreary just said we should get off the CAC kick and not have any amenities flow from density uplifts. It's an interesting thing that we should explore because discretionary zoning allows the city to take value from the lift that's provided to the developer for things like pools, public art, affordable housing, and so on. And so if the NPA is gonna give up on that system, I think it'd be good to clarify that. I also think it'd be good to know whether or not the NPA will crush the STIR program, which uh, Councillor uh, Anton has often repeated, uh, uh, promised to do, and leave renters with nothing. So it'd be good to clarify those points tonight. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mays. I'll, I'll do that. Uh, yes, the uh, NPA will stop this, the disastrous STIR program immediately. <laughs> the, the giveaway is to the tune of $100,000 per suite to developers, and uh, that includes property tax, uh, often in many cases, property tax deferments, or just they don't pay property tax for something like 20 years or more. And they, uh, that, that's increasing your property taxes, among other things, in the process, because the money's got to come from somewhere from the city. And so... Bill, Bill uh, tell them about vaccines in the church. Yeah, well, okay, we won't get into specific projects. I'm sorry, but I, I can't, I don't have the time, I'm not seconds. But the, 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 the rents that are coming out of these, this, this is supposed to be affordable. The rents that are coming out of these projects are $3 a square foot. That's not affordable. The, the, you're, you're paying $1,050 for a, a, a 390 square foot bachelor unit that's about the size of a hotel room in, in, in the West End. I mean, these are not affordable ho uh, uh, housing. And, and if it's rental, that's fine. But anyway, so we're, it's, it's toast when we're elected. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bill. Elizabeth? Thank you. Um, yeah, if, uh, if I'm elected and NSD is, is in the majority, we will definitely uh, stop the STIR program. Uh, it has been a, a terrible disaster, and as far as I'm concerned, I, I can't believe that the uh, council brought it in without any consultation uh, whatsoever. It's, it, it's unfathomable because it's such a huge program. And uh, further, the, the incentives are just not justified at all uh, as far as there's no affordability, there is huge impacts on all of the neighbors around the neighborhood around there. And also, it actually inflates uh, the land values around it and, and also the rents of, of other buildings around it because anything that comes into these new buildings will affect the existing rentals around them to because to, it, it affects market rates. So it actually has a detrimental effect on, on existing rentals. So I think that what we need to do is reassess how we can, first of all, retain our existing more affordable rentals, make it more reasonable to upgrade them, and to ensure that, um, that new rental is built through other mechanisms that don't cause uh, a, um, more inflationary pressures. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yet again, it comes down to the value of land. 
people don't build rental because they can't make money building rental, and people who build buildings do so because they make money building buildings. So we had to talk with people to say, what would get you to build rental? And I challenge the other parties here to tell me how they would get rental built in the city without subsidizing. The fees that are forgiven are fees that would never have been collected if the buildings weren't built. They are forgiven over a period of time. This city is, as you've heard, over 50% renters. The rental stock is aging, it's in trouble. We're using very strict measures to defend the people who are in, in their apartments and getting renovations. But we have people moving into the city and we need more rental stock in this city. Vision Vancouver promises to continue to build vision, uh, rental stock so that people aren't forced down the housing um, down the housing spectrum. And what's happening right now is that as people get forced out of the rental, they move into a lesser and lesser priced rental until we've got people kicking people out of the really low income housing in the downtown east side. We've seen that happen. We've seen people moving from the west end to the downtown east side to find affordable rental and pushing people out onto the street. We're in danger of becoming a city of the very rich and the very poor. We cannot afford to subsidize housing for middle income people, but we need to provide it. Market rental does just that. If you aren't providing market rental, you're ignoring the vast majority of people with moderate incomes who want to stay in our city. Okay, Jason. My take on the STIR program is it's been an incredible failure, unfortunately, for the city of Vancouver. And I understand that every government that comes into office is going to come up with a tool to help facilitate development so that we can accommodate the thousands of people that are moving here every year. Uh, Vision Vancouver created a program called STIR. Basically what they've done is they've said, keep your developer fees, we'll stick some rental housing unit into that project to allow you to go further up. Um, what that's done over the past three years is created a social uh, infrastructure deficit in our city. We see that. I mean, we don't have money to invest in our community centers. We don't have our money to invest in libraries and the things that we need to upgrade. Uh, they're falling apart now. And so we clearly can't be going down this road. Another thing that this does, it's a short-term incentive for rental. What it seems to have done is taken the timeline to actually develop a building and it's compressed it to speed things up, to build the rental. But it's been at the expense of public consultation and at the needs of the community. And so that's something that we need to rectify immediately because in my neighborhood again and in various parts in Vancouver, we're seeing these towers that are being thrown in under this plan and it subverts everything that you're saying. And people that have spoken out against it, uh, again, there's no discretion being shown and it's always a default to maximum heights, maximum this, maximum profit. And we need to look at this from a really holistic point of view where we have a development tool that meets the needs, but are, I would say, more incremental in nature. Okay, I think people are throwing a lot of things into one pot. Uh, I, think the, uh, I think the former speaker just was throwing any kind of spot rezoning and mixing it in with stir. I think what council wanted to do and there was, was to create rental housing. And I think a lot of us didn't think there was enough time for consultation with the public. And there was a misunderstanding, certainly as a councillor, I thought we were trying to create affordable rental. And it became quite clear that we weren't providing affordable rental and we were foregoing DCLs. We do need to create rental in the city, all kinds of rental. We need to create rental for people on the west side of town who are going to downgrade and leave their houses and are looking for something. And as, as a renter myself, who just uh, his house has just been sold out from under me after 32 years, uh, we need to create affordable rental. We need to create rental in the downtown east side that's safe and affordable. So we need a real continuum, a mix of various types of rental housing. You know, I just was checking with the staff uh, about the STIR project, and it does end, I think it's December 17th, that none of us actually come on stream yet, and we haven't done, hmm? yeah, they're all, they're all, but they're not quite there yet. So I I actually think that we need to look at what's, what is coming on stream. I also think we need to get more from the developers. There's one thing is the rental housing, but it's we also need to ask more for the developers for community amenities. So I, I, let's not throw everything in the one pot, but let's say I do believe developers need to give back to the community a lot more in terms of community amenities.
Um, the reason I would vote no is that, first of all, it's quite clear that um, the trade-off for density is, a, is an excuse for both rental and, uh, and for community amenities. And I just have to think, well, where does that process end? If you're thinking of creating the money and the community amenities by just getting denser and denser and having more and more high-rises, it just sounds like bad public policy to me. Um, you have to find a way to supply the rental housing and to supply the community amenities with not, not on the basis of just doing a trade-off for density, because our city otherwise will have high-rises everywhere. Secondly, I think that Elizabeth raised a good point, which is that those high-rises end up um, creating or inflating the value of land, and that puts at risk the current stock of affordable rental housing we have. People in Marple are very afraid of what's happening to them. They have good, solid, nice apartments down there. They don't want to see those lost. Third, my worry is that the, the, the STIR program is becoming the norm, and developers realize that that's the way they can get their developments passed instead of the community plans and working within the current zoning. And finally, Heather challenged um, how would you go about doing it? I asked City Council, I went to a hearing and asked you to put forward a resolution to the BC Federation of Municipalities in support of bringing back in tax incentives for developers at the national, or a national tax incentive, incentive for developers to receive bonuses for actually building rental housing again, like we have in Vancouver in the past. So development in every part of the city is governed by a set of rules called uh, district schedules and development guidelines. And uh, these tell you what you can build, how high and how dense. Spot rezoning is used to override these rules. In the past six years, so we're looking at the past uh, two councils, uh, more spot rezoning have come before council than in the previous 20, uh, most to increase height and density. So the questions are, should council stick to current zoning, and how does spot rezoning benefit or hurt the city, and what policy would you pursue? So, Elizabeth? Thank you. Well, I think that one of the biggest issues is that spot rezoning should be the exception, not the rule. And unfortunately, so seldom does it seem that major, you know, any larger sites are, are actually kept to the existing zoning these days. It's almost the exception where they build within the existing zoning. So I think that that policy needs to be reversed. And um, generally speaking, I think that it has a, the opposite effect in, in terms of affordability. Rather than actually creating more affordability, it creates less because it basically says that it's a free-for-all out there. There's always an expectation that there's going to be, the land is worth more than, than what it would be under the existing zoning. So again, that, that causes inflationary and development pressures on, on lower density areas. And oftentimes that isn't even necessarily something on areas that would get redeveloped right away. It might be something that may get redeveloped down the line, but it, it still has an impact on, on land value, which affects everyone. So I think that, that they need to be, uh, the existing zoning bylaws and, and schedules need to be respected, and only on the exception, where it really makes sense, should any spot rezonings happen. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, spot roads rezonings are a tool that we do use in the city, and again, with the increasing pressures of population increase, climate change, and incredibly inexpensive or incredibly unaffordable land, spot rezoning is how we pay for a lot of our amenities in the city in recent years. Again, I challenge the other people to come up with something other than just negotiating with the federal government for more tax dollars to come back to us, which we have been doing. We have three tools that we essentially use to develop our city and to create amenities: property tax 
development fees, and other types of fines like uh, parking costs and so forth. Those are the ways that we pay for things here. And those uh, community amenity contributions that we get from rezonings are incredibly important to pay for parks, to pay for cultural space, to pay for daycare. Those are the things that they pay for. So yes, we have done a fair amount of them. They do need to be taken in context of neighborhoods. They do need to be taken in context of transit, a very, very important factor that we're taking into account these days. But we have a very difficult time paying for those things on property tax alone if we didn't have the community amenity contributions. Our, our uh, staff go into very difficult negotiations with these developers. Remember, they're already paying, I think it's $10.50 a square foot now for um, DCLs, development cost levies, before they get to the rezoning. We're adding this on top and we're negotiating the amenities based on, on um, the value lift that will come of the land. So those are very important rezonings for us. They do need to be done with caution but I don't think we're gonna stop doing them because blanket rezoning means that we lose that. And if we don't rezone, we're not building under the current zoning. I've had the pleasure of speaking to Vancouverites all over the city uh, for the entire summer and just listening to a lot of feedback in terms of how development is progressing in their communities. And I'm not hearing a lot of positive responses these days. Uh, there is a lot of frustration with the way the city is approaching things. And I think that moving forward, the zoning does need to be reevaluated because what we're doing, uh, it's not substantially increasing the rental stock. It's not substantially uh, raising enough CACs and DCLs to invest in our social infrastructure. And in terms of does it hurt or benefit the city, um, clearly, there's uh, 12,000 people that are upset downtown. There's countless other people in this community upset with other spot rezonings. And I think it's unfair when spot rezoning takes the place of effective community planning. And I really think that community planning and efficient public consultation needs to form the core of how we develop our neighborhoods. And until the city of Vancouver starts doing that, and it starts respecting the plans that are already in place and not overriding them through the director's planning or what have you. We're not gonna make substantial gains or we're not gonna be providing efficient uh, development in the community. And there's too many people that are moving here every year for us to not uh, collaborate with people and to work with residents and not over residents. Well, I fought very hard for neighborhoods, and I will continue to fight for neighborhoods because I think they're the backbone of a healthy city. And I think that to make neighborhoods strong, we need area plans. We actually need an electoral form reform. We need wards and some version of the <laughs> court I think what we're having and what people are really angry about is the spot rezonings are overriding existing plans, whether it's city plan or other types of plan, and the pl area plans that were promised a year ago haven't just kicked into place just very recently for Marple and West End, Grandview Woodlands and the downtown east side. So people felt like, you know, these spot rezonings have happened an incredible density along Canby Street. Um, proposed density at Kingsway and Main, uh, proposals in the West End, and uh, people in the downtown east side are concerned about condoization and the increase of land values in the, in the downtown east side, driving people onto the street. So we have to figure out how we are going to build area plans that are strong enough to really provide communities with what they want, and also to provide the housing that people need in these areas and the amenities that they need. The city has very little money to play with. We get eight cents on the tax dollar. The feds haven't been at the table for housing since 93. We need all three levels of government to be working on this question because as Councillor Deal said, we have, we've got very few tools at our disposal, but I think one of the strongest things that we have are strong neighborhoods and I'd actually put more, in the, more money into the planning department and better working relationships and the area plans are strong enough to build what we need. Yes, I think uh, council should stick to the current zoning, um, but I think that it's we all need to recognize that there are um, many neighborhood plans, community plans that are 
in the in the queue to be done, and so therefore the the zoning is is out of date, and so there's a need to really move those forward. I think Ellen, that's what you're talking about. Get them done faster so that we can have more current um, current zoning in place. Um, how does spot rezoning benefit or hurt the city? Well, it's clear um, that there are. The ways that it's being done now is to, to provide money for um, community amenities. Um, it's my premise that, in fact, uh, that we're not getting sufficient community amenities out of those spot rezonings and the money's put forward, that the city and, and you as taxpayers are continuing to put in more money to subsidize the actual impact of those developments and that increased density. On, on the need for community services. Um, how does it hurt? I think it hurts when we have a whole lot of unhappy people um, who are feeling like their voices aren't being listened to and, uh, and the plans that they participated in are not being respected. I think it hurts neighborhood character. And I think there's real concerns about the increased density and the fact that there aren't sufficient services going in and finally I think it is really problematic for traffic. Uh, what would I pursue as policies? Not tax dollars, actually. Um, had a, a tax, uh, tax law, a change in the tax law uh, that would provide tax benefits to investors to build and maintain rental housing. And secondly, perhaps a new law in the city that would generate revenue, something like a derelict or vacant property tax, um, to really get at people who really have to do Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Ross. Well, I just want to talk briefly about what, uh, and I think this is well put, because they are guidelines. The rules are not as rigid as many people believe, and some of our best developments have been as a result of negotiated rezonings. And I want to give people a few examples, including a couple from the neighborhood, and just to remind you that we approved the Mount Pleasant Community Plan without changes, West Point Gray was approved without changes, we've funded three community planning processes for the coming year. These are important commitments, along with a review of community planning citywide to see how we can improve the consolidative process. The rezonings are things like the Woodward's project. It would have been irresponsible to do that at an outright approval. And it would not have proved, uh, produced any CACs, which Mr. Marsh wants, but that would make Mr. McCreary happy because he wants us to kick the CAC habit. You know, another one that's, uh, I think, kind of a relevant example is Little Mountain. It has to be a spot rezoning. It would be ludicrous to leave that site, which is laid fallow because of provincial decisions, without a very, very close look. And I know that the developer and the city have been spending years on that. I wish that something had happened earlier than this. I could go through a number of others, but there's a series of, of rezonings that happen around the town all the time, which are a crucial way for the city to get better value and better design out of a larger site. I see heads shaking, but without that kind of approach, we would see the city to completely stagnate. And the larger sites, the more complex ones near transit, have to have a zoning approach. Without that, the city will simply uh, simply turn in on itself and fold. Bill. Once again, I couldn't be uh, different more with my uh, the gentleman to my right. Uh, the city won't fold. The sky will not fall if we don't give away the kinds of things we've been giving away with this spot rezoning and stir and a number of other <laughs> recent planning initiatives that uh, are, are just, just not workable. They're, they're, they're doing things to neighborhoods which are irreparable. And that, in fact, is one of the re main reasons I decided to run <clears throat> for council this year, because I, as an architect and a former parks commissioner, am really offended by what this council is doing <clears throat> in the city. It's time to stop it, and that's why I'm running, and I hope that uh, people in Vancouver will get out and vote to, uh, to uh, help us uh, to, to, to move ahead in a positive, constructive way. The, um, uh, uh, Mr. Megas was talking about uh, CACs. I didn't say we don't need CACs. What I said is the present way of backroom deals being made. In fact, the developers are being blackmailed uh, by, by the city planning staff right now. They are, yes. And they are, are, the whole thing is just a, a completely uh, illegal process, in fact. And uh, it, it can't, it's got to stop. We've got to have preset uh, amenity uh, levies that are publicly known beforehand so that the land value, for one thing, is, can be determined. At the moment, it's a crapshoot. 
Thank you. All right, thank you, Bill. And thank you, everybody, for your response to that question. Uh, the next question has to do with the neighborhood we're in, and I'm just curious how many people uh, consider themselves residents of this neighborhood? Wow. Great. Okay. So we're going to start with Jason, and uh, uh, the question is, uh, in a city-sponsored survey, 91% uh, of the people from this neighborhood rejected the height of a development proposal five blocks from here. Uh, but many say that planning continues to go forward without major changes. How do you deal with the oft-heard complaint that the planning department is not listening to citizen input? Are there any lessons to be learned here, and how would you do it better? Um, my take on the planning department right now is the fact that we don't have a uh, mayor and council that's effectively working with them so that they show some type of discretion. Uh, I said earlier that if we look at the voting records and the development that's happened in Vancouver, it's always defaulting to maximum heights and maximum everything. It almost seems like council is disconnected from the decision-making process. And council, you're voting for councillors to make political decisions on your behalf. And um, when you have a neighborhood here that has large towers coming in and that's not what you want, that should translate into a dialogue with council that helps shape the outcome of that building. And until you have councillors that are more driven to be in your communities and to be open and to respect the different points of view, to find a compromise where these buildings can be developed in uh, a more amicable way for all the stakeholders while still moving us forward, I don't see any changes happening. Uh, lessons to be learned. We need to work more closely with residents. There's ways where we could have brought the height of that building down, I'm sure. Um, whether it's freeing up some of the space with the art center in the bottom, or there's other creative approaches we could have taken, but the, these discussions aren't happening. We're not exploring ways of making it better. It's just, it's closed doors, it's, you know, the whole city hall is a fortress type thing, and I'm sorry, but your input isn't being listened to, and it's not fixing or changing any of the decisions that are happening right now. I think that it's, number one, the first thing that I would do would support neighborhood organizations. I think we have some very good examples like Grand New Woodland Area Council and the Downtown and Neighborhood Council. I think each neighborhood should have an organization that has formal uh, voice at City Hall. That's the number one thing that I would do. I think that's absolutely critical. Number two, I think that we need to give a strong statement to planning department that when proposals are going forward, that there is a proper consultation and a dedicated staff person to each neighborhood who works with the neighborhood around those concerns, and that the concerns of the neighborhood come back to council, the full document come back, comes back to council. Uh, thirdly, I think that we need to have advance notice of these things. So the neighborhoods have adequate time to really review a pro uh, project properly, and the council has enough time to review something. Sometimes we're not getting reports until Friday, and we're debating them already on Tuesday. So I think that those are three concrete ways that we can go forward that would really ensure that the neighborhood impact is heard and listened to by staff, and that it actually does get to council, so the council knows exactly what the neighborhood thinks, rather than it being rewritten in a staff report in an, a version that they think is what, what needs to happen. I want to be able to compare what the neighborhood says with what the staff says, and I'm not able to do that at this point. Well, when citizens go to public hearings, and hundreds of them go, and they stay up till two in the morning, as the town news ones one session went to. And they they are pretty well unanimously against a proposal. And then staff recommends something different than what they say, and council votes in a different way. Then it's not just superficial complaints. This is this is real and genuine complaints about public process not being done properly. It's really critical that uh, we not look at public input or hearings as venting sessions. We have to figure out ways in which to really involve people in a meaningful way, not just in a superficial, you, we've got your opinion now, so thank you very much way. 
I think that I think there are ways to do it. I've just talked to people in the in the uh, Northeast Falls Creek area, and they say that they are happier, or they become happier once they sit down with the developer at the same table in discussions with the planning department. So they weren't segregated and separated, and they got to talk with each other at the same time. I will also say that there have been planning processes in this city that have been exceedingly good. Uh, one that I was involved in, and lots of people I knew were, was a long time ago, but it had to do with the whole shaping of the Falls Creek area in the post-Expo uh, 86 era. Fabulous plans, fabulous ideas. And then the provincial government sold all the property and Concord Pacific took over and we didn't get what we wanted. But their true and genuine ability to involve citizens is absolutely possible and that's where we have to go. I think the uh, reference is specifically to the uh, Rise Alliance proposal, and uh, it's not before council yet. My understanding is that since it began uh, discussions and going into the planning process a couple of years ago, the density has come down, the height has come down, the number of rental units have come down, and uh, the discussion is not over with. So I'm not sure at which point 91% were opposed to it. If 91% are opposed to it in the public hearing, I guess we'll learn that at that point. But I would say the community plan did identify that site for additional density and height and uh, the plan was supported widely in the community. So we'll have to uh, wait, wait and see what it gets before council how to balance off what the community plan said with what is now proposed as a result of this process. So uh, how do I deal with the Oxford complaint? Uh, we have, as I said, endorsed three community plans coming up, Grandview, Woodlands, Marple, and the West End. There were a lot of important lessons of the West End Mayor's Advisory Committee, which we're going to try to apply to consultation citywide, and I think that we'll see some dramatic improvements. But at the same time, I think there's always going to be conflict about change in the community. And uh, communities are facing more of it now because the downtown core is largely built out and we're seeing transit investment in other parts of the city and communities are wrestling with how they want that to, uh, to unfold. And uh, the city has a responsibility, I think in my mind, to be sustainable across the board. And so communities have a, a, a responsibility also to take their share of that sustainability, whether it's in social housing or transit or in more affordable housing. No. Um, I, again, Mr. Banks and I are not on the same page. I, uh, no, uh, sustainability. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, we're, we're sustainable on that, on that one fact. Um, the, um, the, 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 the kind of process he was talking about, in fact, is what I call Wild West planning. Everything's up for grabs. Nobody knows what the deal is, and, and uh, uh, there, there are no set rules. And there's no values, no priorities, and, no, and, no, and, the, and the end result is usually something that, that, uh, that certainly the communities uh, don't don't like and don't want. I think the Rise Project has some potential, but it needs a lot more work. Um, it's a long way down the pipe, unfortunately, uh, and uh, I'm not sure how much can can be done to change it. But I would like to see. A couple of things happen. I'd like to see the STIR part of it taken out completely. The STIR program, as I said earlier, is a waste of time, a waste of money. It's not going to provide affordable housing. Why keep it? The the, uh, the condo units in there will be bought, and many of them will be rented. I, I own a condo downtown, and I'm renting it. Uh, in fact, I'm subsidizing the person that's living in there by $300 a month. So. Um, that's that's uh, a, what, one of the suggestions I'd like to make. The other one is about this project. I'd like to see a um, um, the artist studio, 10,000 square feet. That's 100 artists. Where are 100 artists going to come to want to work in, in that space? I don't think it's going to happen. It's not realistic. So I'd like to su suggest instead that that CAC money for the artist studio, the artist studio be reduced or eliminated completely, and the CAC money go to mm -hmm. The um, Mount Pleasant pool that the Vision Council promised last time and didn't deliver. Thank you. This Rise Alliance project that has resulted, um, it was the, the first large development that has come after a three year planning process on the Mount Pleasant plan. 
And I think the fact that it is so out of scale with what is around in the neighborhood, it goes to show how this planning process was completely flawed at the end in the sense that it didn't end up reflecting what the community wanted. And, and this goes in, is completely out of scale with the, the many people that, that had supported heritage because it is a heritage neighborhood and uh, increased density but more in the scale to, to work with the character of the neighborhood. So I think that um, it, it goes to show that the planning processes coming forward and, and the new three planning processes that are now proposed are a particular concern. They're, they're talking about completely rewriting new terms of references that um, really uh, don't have a lot of opportunity for neighborhoods to, to have their voices reflected in the outcomes of these, these processes. So I'm very concerned about that. And um, I, I think that as far as these processes go, that we really need to change how we do them. And certainly uh, this, does, this project does not reflect what was intended out of that three-year process. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Rise Alliance project, as you know, has not come before Council yet, and we will look for that feedback when it gets there. But I've got a lot of things I can comment on here. First of all, if the NDA were in power, you would get a, pro a pro project without art space and without rental space. And yet, in your plan that you spend a lot of time on, it gives a high priority to artist space and to rental space. It also identifies a couple of large sites that could be used for tall buildings, and this is one of them. In terms of no changes, it's already come down seven stories in the, in the pre-discussions. It hasn't come to us. So, um, yes, 26 to 19 stories. And I can point to many other examples where we have lowered things. Fraser and Broadway, we took three floors off of that building at the neighborhood's request, and we lost a lot of rental housing as a result. At Shannon Muse, the building was completely changed in its shape and its height and its massing. And uh, the buildings in Marple have changed due to, to uh, community input. Community input does help us make these decisions. But your own community plan identifies arts as a priority, it, it identifies rental as a priority, and condos do provide temporary rental, but we've done the studies. People are always wondering when the person's going to resell or move in. It doesn't provide the stability and the assurances that rentals need, renter, renters uh, need in the city to know that they can continue to live in their neighborhoods. We will look at the rise of lines, we will look at what the community feedback is, and I think these new processes that we're putting in place are very positive, and I look forward to being engaged in them. Okay, thank you everybody for your responses to that question. And then the last question I'm going to ask is the food question. Um, and this is a very interesting one that's created quite a buzz in the um, food security community recently. Uh, Vancouver uh, Port CEO and President uh, Robin Sylvester was recently quoted in BC Business as saying, it's critically important that the regional growth strategy and the municipalities recognize industrial land must be preserved. Otherwise, the economy will, over time, wither. Agriculture is emotionally important, but economically of relatively low importance to the lower mainland. And in terms of food security, it's almost meaningless. What's your reaction to this? And what role does food security play in the planning process? Is it really meaningless? Is it? I mean, I know I'm crying, so I know it's uh, emotionally uh, wrenching, but uh, what do you think? Uh, I think we'll start with uh, Adrienne on this one. Okay, agriculture is emo emotionally important. I mean, is this guy an alien? <laughs> Last time I checked, we all need food to survive. Um, so if there's any more fundamental program than ensuring you have some food security and ability to produce food at your regional level, I don't know what is. That is critical. And speaking then of his role at the port, perhaps he should look at whether or not we should be having crude oil tankers coming out of the port for the the current economy that we have with one spill, let alone our quality of life and beaches. 
Um, what I'd like to say on this is, is this. I'd like to praise the current council for its actual food policies in the city. I think they've done a good job and I think they're on the right track. Uh, I think that, uh, that, that where um, they weren't on the right track and it was part of not just their decision but a regional decision was in fact the, the removal of uh, the word livable region plan and the replacement of our regional plan by the words regional growth strategy. Yes. Yes. I was honestly in terms of livability because words and the titles of your documents mean a lot. I think we have to maintain an economic base. It might not be in the city of Vancouver so smart to retain industrial land as our commercial sectors. And I do fear for the loss of business licenses that we're feeling in the city and that we need to pay attention to that. Uh, well, I haven't seen this comment, but it's, it's ignorant and stupid and poorly informed. <laughs> and it's uh, from someone who is uh, sponsoring the widening of the second narrow so we export of oil sands oil from, uh, from the Kinder Morgan port, so it's pretty astonishing. It's important, of course, to protect industrial land because people have to have a place to work. And the city of Vancouver has a very small amount left, but I think it's important to protect it. And, uh, and so, you know, really, my reaction, I, I find it's an unbelievable statement and completely irresponsible. It's shocking from someone who is at the helm of one of our largest economic uh, pieces of infrastructure. Great, thank you. Bill? Uh, thank you. I, um, uh, I, I don't quite understand this question either entirely, although not quite in the same way that uh, Mr. Banks does. <laughs> I, um, I was, I'm old enough to, um, to remember when the Agricultural Land Reserve was created back in the, in the 70s. And that was a very uh, far-sighted and a very, very important thing for the entire province, and in particular for the Lower Mainland. I talked about values earlier in communities and neighborhoods. One of the values that we have, have determined when we set up the Agricultural Land Reserve was that we did value agricultural land in the 1970s, and as far as I'm concerned, we still do. That needs to be a, a sacred part of, of what is happening in the metro area, or, or that, that land needs to be protected and, and, uh, and used as agricultural land, not as uh, fill sites for, uh, for, for uh, uh, dump trucks. Um, and um, the, uh, the other thing is that industrial land on that side of it, and again, I'm an architect. I've, I've designed many industrial buildings. They're typically one story. And you, you, you could easily, look, look at Gastown, look at the older uh, industrial areas in Vancouver. They were five, six stories. We can do multi-story industrial land, which is it's just a little bit more expensive, but the land, so is the land. We're running out of land, so we can, we can do that. The other thing is that the industrial is used for car dealerships, in, in the city of Vancouver and in, in Richmond and other, other cities in, in the Baylor mainland. And it houses lawyers' offices, engineers' offices, retail facilities. It's not industrial. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the, this, um, this council did support the regional growth strategy and, and I think that that was a terrible mistake because the regional growth strategy significantly weakens the protection of the green zone including agricultural land under the ALR and and I think that that was a terrible mistake further that um, you know how can we be considered or work, working towards the green being the green, greenest city when at the same time we're uh, supporting urban agriculture, but we're not supporting the protection of the agricultural land. And uh, I think that under the old system with the uh, Livable Region Strategic Plan, which had the Green Zone, there was a much clearer um, support for, for the agricultural land, whereas now we only have an urban containment boundary that can be easily moved with only a 50% plus one vote. And, and convert it into industrial, which is the first step towards urbanization. And I think that that was a, a, a terrible oversight and uh, we should not have moved in that direction at all. So I, I think that 
it, as far as in the long term, agricultural land is extremely precious. It, it may not have buildings all over it, but it is extremely precious and it must be retained for the long term. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm proud to be part of a council that has absolutely defended the ALR every time we get a chance to. In terms of the uh, livable region strategy, the regional growth strategy, we tested that thing for months. We pushed it, we poked at the buttons, and we're satisfied that the protection is in, that, in place or we wouldn't have agreed to it. Uh, it's a very strong plan. It's transit-oriented. It contains urban sprawl. I can tell you there are a lot of communities uh, further out of the central area that didn't like it very much, but eventually came around to supporting it, and I think it's a good plan. That said, ALR needs to be protected absolutely and unqualified. As, as uh, Councillor Meg said, this is a, a really, really disturbing statement here. But the other thing that I'm loving that we can protect in the city is the urban agriculture scene. And, and Ross and many others here have done amazing jobs with food. We have a, a downtown block right now that's an empty site in the downtown east side. There was a parking lot. It's now not only producing food, it's that's producing food that it sells for um, profit at the, ta at the uh, farmer's markets. It is not one of those sites. Thank you, Joseph. Um, but it's, uh, we're doing an amazing job of expanding our, our community centers and their, I'm sorry, our community gardens, the rooftop gardens, vertical farming is going to be coming into the city. You can look for that in the near future. We can grow a lot of our food right here in the city. And although we have very little ALR land in the city, it's in Southlands, I think we can make ourselves a virtual ALR just by doing urban farming right here in Vancouver. Uh, there'll be time for questions shortly. Thank you. Uh, Jason? Okay, so the two things that are being addressed here are industrial land and uh, agriculture. Starting with industrial land, I don't know if Vancouver's really maximizing the benefit of the land we have. And I specifically think of areas like Markwell. You have places in the city of Vancouver that lack any type of recreation or entertainment amenities. It's, it's almost a neglected part of our city. And underneath it, we have a huge belt of industrial land that's just full of vacancies. It's not being well utilized. And I, I, we're not going to bring back an agrarian economy here, so we really should be courting and looking at this land and finding exciting ways of bringing knowledge-based companies to start setting up shop there. The NPA wants to raise the standard of living for Vancouverites, and we need to do that through smart land use and by inviting businesses that are going to set up shop here in mixed-use neighborhoods where people can actually have high paying jobs and not have to move to Surrey or Burnaby or Toronto because that's where all the businesses are going now. It, we have to stop the bleeding. Part of sustainability is to have a sustainable economy. And with agriculture, uh, I think the urban agriculture movement is great. I think that community gardens provide a much needed social uh, amenity to our neighborhoods, but I'm not I'm under no illusions that it's going to provide our source of food. Um, I think that what we need to do is to uh, encourage building more community gardens and those types of facilities because it starts the dialogue of where does our food come from, how are we going to eat in a post-carbon world when things are going to be harder to get into the city. And also, um, just basically to promote these from the bottom up and not have Gregor's Garden with $50,000 dumped into it as a profit. Okay. Community gardens come from the community. Thank you, Jason. Alan? I think this council has been dedicated to making Vancouver the greenest city by 2020. There's no question about it. That there's the number of staff that are dedicated to it. Gregor set up a task force with Councilor Reimer and Councilor Cadman on it, with the top folks in this town. And they came up with the Greater City Action Tank proposal. Uh, there's 10 major points. It's all broken down. It's all available on the website. There was tremendous uh, community consultation. There was an online way of people putting input. Um, the drive to create uh, a greener city was incorporated in, into building codes. It was incorporated into the, the as uh, Councillor Deal mentioned, a number of different ways it's going ahead. Uh, we've got five community uh, gardens going. Um, I completely support and I believe Vision supports uh, a neighborhood farmer's hub where farmers could keep, bring their produce, they could clean it, they could store it, and they could distribute it so year round. Um, We've, uh, you know, as a proud Strathcona community gardener for about 26 years now, I was just down there and uh, 
this young girl pedaling a bike and, and grinding the corn, the, the grinding the wheat that uh, MPA laughs at. These, these kids were just gung-ho about it, and it was being transformed into pizza that they were eating, and they got it, you know, and this was, this was wheat that was brought in from all over the city. So I think we're, we're well over 2,010 gardens around the city. People are engaged. Vancouver's incredibly vulnerable by not having that much agricultural land, and less than 10% of our land is industrial land. That has to be protected. But we can do this in lots of different ways, and I think this city has shown a commitment to totally working in every way possible to do that. So that concludes my questions for the evening. I'm just curious, are there other uh, candidates for council in the audience? And if you're here, please stand up. Okay, uh, I think we have a little bit of time. If you'd like to very, very briefly introduce yourself and perhaps make a 30 second statement. Hello. 30 seconds, I gotta talk fast. Um, we elected the Sam Sullivan uh, government in 2005, and they ignored neighborhoods. We voted for change, and we elected the Vision Vancouver government, and they've ignored, they've not only ignored neighborhoods, they completed every single thing the Sam Sullivan government started, including rezoning Norquay, the laneway houses in Dunbar, the densification in Shaughnessy. Uh, they have literally been the clone of the NPA. We're running as, as neighborhoods for sustainable Vancouver, and the, the most of our candidates are from neighborhood groups around the city. We are dedicated to having neighborhoods in the city of Vancouver have a real say, and when they have a say at council, we're dedicated to what they have to say to be respected and honored. Okay, thank you. And uh, what is your name, sir? My name is Terry Martin, and I'm running with uh, Randy Helton for mayor and uh, three other council candidates. Uh, I ask you to vote for uh, Neighborhoods for Sustainable Vancouver. Okay, we thank are you. the option. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Joe Frangia. I'm running with the NPA. First of all, I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak to everyone. Since I got to speak very fast, a couple of things. Uh, Heather Deal and a couple of the other councillors kept saying how the main important driving force between determining spot zoning and determining the height of buildings is land value. You know what I say? It's talking to our neighborhoods and determining what is best for your neighborhood, not land values. And if we need help from the federal government, talk to the federal government, talk to the provincial government, dialogue with people, dialogue with you people. That's how we get answers. It's not always land value. It's not always the developer. It's not always money. Sometimes it's the people that need to talk. My name is Joe Karanja. I'm running for Vancouver City Council. Thank you so very much. Hi, my name is Heidi McDonald. I live in the West End and I'm not running for anything. Um, <laughs> I have two questions. The first question well, is... Well, actually, we're going to have time for questions from the audience later. Right now we're just taking uh, statements from uh, council candidates. At the well, the let's hope there's time. There we go. <laughs> okay, who's next? Hi, I'm Sandy Garasino, and uh, I'm an independent candidate running for Vancouver City Council. Uh, I was a, a co-founder and uh, architect of the uh, Vancouver Not Vegas Coalition that put a stop to the uh, casino in... in uh, <laughs> and I'm running uh, as an independent uh, on purpose because I, I think we've got to get past the rancor and culture of conflict at City Hall, and we've got to open the way for independents to get into city council, and the only way we can do that, there's so much money with the major parties that are involved, the only way can we, we can do that is if you, the voters, say we want independence in city hall. I'm very concerned that we've got to deal with this affordability thing, and none of the, t none of the things that are being said addresses the real problem. We have, um, relative to median income, our housing prices are 56% higher than New York City's. 
and 32% higher than London. That's relative to median income. That's because of global international capital that is flowing in here, and we've got to do something about that and redirect that in a way that's positive. Thank you. <laughs> Just no casino, Garasino. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> Hello, my name is Nicole Benson. I'm running with Neighborhoods for Sustainable Vancouver. And I'm running with them for a couple of reasons. One is that I feel it's the only slate of candidates that is actually going to bring real democracy back into City Hall, listen to the communities and listen to the voices of the people. We don't take any funding from developers or any other private interest that might cause a conflict of interest. We don't take any big money from anyone, just individuals like you and like me that want to have a voice and have a say in the future of this city. Thank you. Hello, my name is Marie Kircham. I'm a resident of Vancouver for more than 40 years. I'm also a grandma, and I haven't been involved in politics before, but I am now, and I'm uh, with the NSV team. The reason is, I've been to City Hall, our neighborhood has had all the same problems that you're experiencing, and I was shocked by the arrogance, the lack of listening. I was shocked by how I was treated and how it really didn't matter. So um, I thought, well, I have a lot of experience. I've been the registrar of the BC College of Teachers, which is the regulatory body for the teaching profession for more than 17 years, I'm retired now. That body works in the public interest by legislation. I was uh, reporting to a board of 20 uh, council We're members. Yes, and um, I can tell you I know about public interest, and if you vote for our team, all of your interests will be included, not just those of the developers for our city. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Mike Class, and I'm a Vancouver City Council candidate with uh, the Nonpartisan non Association, and I am here uh, as well as, I believe, uh, my fellow candidates, uh, Joe Prangi, uh, Jason LaMarche, and a couple other people, and Bill McCurry, and others who have uh, come and gone this evening. Uh, I am a born and raised Vancouverite, and currently live on uh, in the Fraser Street neighborhood. Uh, I have been, uh, I'm also the uh, co-founder of CityCaucus.com, which uh, provided a uh, a dialogue and a little bit of a different look at uh, politics here in the city. Um, I'm also a former vice chair of the Vancouver City Planning Commission, where we uh, developed a, uh, a number of policies there, including a, a look at adaptive reuse uh, policy for uh, more sustainable building development in the long term for the city. And uh, I am a proud parent, a, a husband, and also uh, actively involved in my community. And I'm Extremely pleased that all of you are out here actively engaging in the political process here tonight. Thank you. Yeah, hi, my name is Jerry McGuire. I'm a uh, candidate for mayor, independent uh, party called Vancouver Citizens Voice. We're actually, I'm sorry, we're actually just here in council. Yeah. Is that okay? Okay, great. Thanks. Oh, thank you. And uh, we're going to skip the transgressions of this previous council because I think everybody's pretty well aware. But uh, some of my uh, core policies and beliefs, I'm dedicated to keeping St. Paul's Hospital downtown. <laughs> thank you. I will enact a surtax on unoccupied, unoccupied residences. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I believe that both TransLink and the Metro Regional District must be democratized by the direct election of the respective boards. And I am in favor of most of the priority actions outlined in the Greenest City Action Plan. However, I am not in favor of a fanatical adherence to a fixed set of goals regardless of cost, taxation levels, and or social disruption. It is my strong belief that the fundamental principles of open, transparent, and accountable democracy are not more important than saving the planet, but rather are essential to it. Do we have any other uh, candidates for council, or I guess for mayor for that matter, that would like to make a brief statement? No, 
Okay. Um, so we're going to move on to the next portion. Sandra, do you want to introduce the next portion? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
community amenity spaces is the very good use of that space, just like the the um, church on on Tenth Avenue, St. James. St. James Square. Thank you. Okay, and our next question. Uh, my name is John. My name is John Shader, and I live uh, on Nineteenth uh, on Quebec, uh, just up the street. And uh, my question arises out of a very short premise, and that premise is that cities are made up of three different groups. Uh, the by far largest are those who live in the city and the neighborhoods. Second largest, but much smaller, is those who work in the city, and they often live in the city. And by far the smallest group is those who make money off of the city. And the people doing the Occupy Vancouver might call them the 1%, a very unpopular group right now. So my question arising from that is, we've heard some other ideas tonight around different curbs that could be put on developers and land speculators given the cost of land in Vancouver. And aside from the curbs and the bylaws we have now, I would like to hear from any other people up front of what other curbs could you see to limit and undermine the power that developers and especially land speculators have on our city right now? Okay, so let's have uh, three respondents. Let's have either uh, Jason or Bill from NDA, NPA, sorry, uh, and then Adrian, and then uh, maybe RJ, would you like to jump in on this as the last respondent? Sure. Okay. So, Bill, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think uh, that's a good question and an important one. The, so, hello, sorry. sorry about that. Yeah, that's a good question and an important one. I, I uh, would like to suggest that, that the way to uh, control land value and, and to control development in general, land value is irrelevant. When I was a, a team uh, park commissioner in the 1970s, we downzoned the West End. We downzoned the downtown. The world didn't come to an end. Land values adjusted accordingly and we, we carried on. So that's a bogus argument. And what we have to have is a planning process that works. And it has to, the process has to start by working with the community that it's supposed to serve. That's what we need to do with our planning process. The planning process right now is very badly broken. It has to be fixed. We've got to make it work for the neighborhoods and I'm committed to doing that on council. Thank you. Okay, Adrian. Yeah, I, I did raise in the earlier questions the idea of a property vacant uh, land tax, and I think that that's, um, sorry, vacant property or derelict property tax, surtax, really. Um, it was brought, one of the place where it was run was Washington, D.C., and it's really worked to limit the kind of um, uh, in, uh, speculative investment that you're talking about. I think we should explore in this city. Okay, and then RJ? So, so just to clarify, you're, you're looking for mechanisms to curb the, the rise in... Further curb. To further curb. Yeah. Um, I think it's the hardest thing that city council has to do because of the powers they have. But we're in a city right now where the house prices have gone up 149%. Um, and affordability is going to be something that we can talk about and isn't going to happen. So the only way that I can see it is if we look at it in the same sort of way that the architect. We've got to get at a way of curbing the power of people who are speculating on our land and driving it up so that it becomes a city that uh, basically a lot of us can't live in. So there are some mechanisms now, but what further mechanisms do you see that could curb that power? Well, I mean, it, it is a difficult and complex question, and I, I, I don't have all the answers around that, but there are also different mechanisms that we can introduce to look to introduce more affordable housing, like inclusionary zoning, for example, that any, any new developments built over six stories tall, uh, that 20% of it be designated as affordable housing. Um, I know, like working with uh, uh, Ellen Woodsworth and, and David Cabin, that they we, we've talked extensively about the different things that Coke can do to to curb it. But um, for now, I'm still learning, and, and I'd like to know more. And, and we'll talk exactly. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.
Yes, my name is uh, Peter Marcus. Uh, I'm a resident of Mount Pleasant. Uh, I've lived here uh, over 30 years. There is a piece of property at between 6th and 7th on Main, right across from number 1 Kingsway. It's an empty parking lot. There is a proposal to put uh, uh, or extend uh, Kingsway to Quebec Street, so it goes down Quebec Street. Now, I think that property could be well used uh, for um, a pool, a uh, ice rink, and or housing. Um, if, uh, if you put the uh, roadway there, that makes it two, two freeways uh, going down uh, towards the uh, waterfront. Are you in favor or uh, against uh, this uh, proposal for the roadway? Okay, so uh, the rotation this time will be uh, Heather, and then uh, Jason, and then Ellen. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Uh, I haven't actually seen that proposal, but I'll speak into some generalities as a result. You need to see who owns the land. Under the current city zoning, land. what... Pardon? City land. It is a city, city land. land. Okay. So then I need to see the traffic plan that would make that reasonable. I'd look at what the costing of a pool and the other amenities versus the costing of the road. Uh, I think it's a good question. It's one I will take back to the planning staff. It has not come forward to us yet. Uh, that corner is a very dangerous corner for pedestrians. And that would be one thing that I would take into account when I look at that. We know that people are very challenged in getting safely to and from number one Kingsway across that triangular intersection. But this council has been very, very strong. Uh, the Cope and Vision Councilors have been very, very strong in saying that we aren't building more roads in the city. That's not our policy. So I'd have to look very closely at the justifications for it, and they'd have to be quite strong. If we were to choose to use it for another purpose, it was probably part of the property endowment fund, uh, and we look at all the pros and cons, and, and we're always open to proposals for building good community amenities. They have to be paid for, of course, and that's the challenge that we face. Just what do you think of uh, pool and ice cream right here? I always think they're great ideas. We have to figure out how to pay for them, and that's that's the, that's the challenge that we Why face. Why should be preserved for that purpose? If we figure out how to pay for them, that's <laughs> always a challenge. Property tax. I mean, if this app. Oh. Hello. If this application hasn't actually been put forward, it's hard for me to comment. It's a bit of a hypothetical. Um, so that clearly, that intersection uh, is problematic for traffic. So whatever goes in there. Uh, it just it needs to make, meet the needs of the various stakeholders that live there. So whether you're introducing new amenities or traffic alterations, uh, it just it has to be part of a collaborative process so that it works for the people. Which again means having an effective public consultation. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing this to my attention. In fact, I I didn't realize that was city land. Uh, obviously, we need a pool in the area. I think we're building uh, rinks as we can, but uh, with an aging demographic population, I think we actually need more swimming pools rather than rinks. But we do have to find the mechanism to build these pools. And I know Mount Pleasant had a wonderful pool. It was very, very key to the core of their community, and it's a tragedy that that uh, that was that couldn't be done financially. And I think that what you all know, and I don't have to tell you, but I'm going to have to say it again, is there are tremendous downloading of social responsibilities to this city. And we're desperately trying to meet existing needs with the eight cents and the tax dollars that we get as a city. And we're not the only city dealing with these headaches, whether it's the, the agonizing situation of uh, homeless people in the streets, if the cold world weather's on, all the things that Occupy Vancouver are talking about. So we really need to stand up and get other levels of government to give the cities, which are the engines of this country now, more money so that we can provide the amenities that are needed. And I think a, a pool at this site is a great idea. We'd have to canvas the community and see if that's what they think is a great idea. And we'd have to find the dollars to build whatever it is the community does want to do. Great, thank you. And our next uh, question. My name is Colleen Dewey, and my question is directed toward any current member of council. Um, I live in the Kensington Cedar Cottage neighborhood, and recently our neighborhood was uh, designated as Little Saigon, and some residents are, can, um, I guess, basically curious or concerned about what the implications are for um, future planning in that neighborhood. Okay, so let's have all current councillors answer that. Jeff, you want to go? Well, the area is uh, 
Basically, what's going to have to happen now, based on the council decision, is a lot more consultation with other area residents and neighbors because a lot of the businesses there have been canvassed and they are in favor of it, but it, it's not clear precisely what will unfold except the enhancement of the business district. So the intention is not really to impact the planning; it's to it's to uh, support and encourage the businesses there, especially the ones that have a Vietnamese uh, you know background or involvement. So. That will uh, be a work in progress. It's something that's come back to council laying out how it's going to be actually implemented. So it shouldn't impact your planning at all, in my view. Okay, that will do, uh, Helen, and then I, we'll I, turn I to Heather. I don't know that we need to, to uh, say anything more. This, what was, what happened is the Vietnamese community came together and were, were it was a deeply moving event at City Hall. There were people from all kinds of of groups in the Vietnamese community and they have been in Canada for quite a few years now and they wanted some way to acknowledge the work that they've done in the community and as, as Canadian citizens and, and the number of businesses they've helped create in that area and they wanted some way to celebrate it and they'd seen what had happened in Chinatown with the putting up of the gate and the designation of that as Chinatown and now Chinatown's a designated heritage area. It's, it has brought uh, vitality to Chinatown. It's, it's, you know, it's been good for all businesses in the area and that's the way they see it. So when it came to council, we were very moved by what they were saying about their lives and the meaning of this for their lives. But we sent it to staff to look at a community process the community can be thoroughly consulted about this idea and see if it works for you. Myself, I was I was deeply moved by what they said and uh, by what they've gone through and the amount of vitality they brought to that stretch of Kingsway and much more needs to be done to revitalize that area. But it will be done in consultation with the community. Okay, Heather? Very brief, yeah. Not much to add. Very briefly, it's a marketing tool, uh, street banners, things like that, um, drawing attention to the fact that if you want the best bow in the city, you know where to go to get it. It's worked for uh, the Punjabi village. Again, uh, many other neighborhoods are looking at this, but there's a high concentration of one type of, of uh, culture that's got a lot of businesses there. Uh, it's a great way to draw attention to it. It doesn't exclude anything. It's inclusive, and it's a marketing tool. Could I, could I, just as a non sure. uh, just a, a quick uh, uh, sort of different perspective from somebody not on council right now. This is a, another example of the ad hoc uh, decision making that, that this council is, uh, seems to be intent on continuing into the next mandate if they're elected. And uh, I, I, I think that, you know, I don't have a problem with Little Saigon. And particularly, but as Councillor Meg suggested, he talked about the businesses being consulted and expressing their point of view. I think you were talking about as a resident, were you not? And and I think both sides in that particular geographic area, neighborhood, need to be brought into the equation. And I, sus I suspect, because of your question, that the neighborhood's residents haven't been. That's the first thing. The second thing is, this is being done on an ad hoc basis. If you want to, to make the city designate areas such, and give them names such as Little Saigon, great, but let's have a policy so that we know what the rules are. Uh, at the moment, I mean, Little Italy, we all know where that is. Greek Street, we know where that is. You know, those are, but those places grew up organically. They're real. And- Councillor Anton voted for it. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not Councillor Anton, but anyway. Two years of consultation. Anyway, that's enough. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my question does require that I give a short history so that it's understood properly. Please keep it under 60 seconds. I will. Um, prior to 2005, uh, do, and what's your name? My name is Terry Martin, and I'm running with Neighborhoods for Sustainable Vancouver. Prior to 2005, the people of Vancouver lost their rights to have a third party appeal to the Board of Variants. Uh, in that term, the five co-councillors were in favor and, and told me that they were in favor of a, a one-line change to the city charter. The reason they were lost is because they weren't enshrined in the city charter. We had those rights for over 40 years. The five co-councillors were in favor of restoring our rights with a simple request to Victoria for a change. The Vision and NPA councillors were opposed and so that didn't happen. In the following term, the NPA Council still refused to restore our third party rights to an appeal to the Board of Variants. In the following term, the 
Vision Council who said they were in favor of restoring our third party rights when they were polled in the, in the campaign, refused to even discuss Barry, it. We're, we're coming up in one minute. So my question is, why do the NPA and Vision Vancouver refuse to restore rights that we enjoyed in our city for over 40 years with a simple change to the Vancouver Charter? Okay, so this is directed more specifically uh, with councillors from those parties who care to answer. Jeff, go ahead. Well, we said we would review it, and uh, I reviewed it and looked at it carefully. We had a lot of legal advice, and my view was that it was uh, correct to leave it the way it was, and that uh, third-party appeals are very divisive, rank versus things to the community, and the Board of Variance is there for people who have a problem with the planning department to get an appeal, and uh, those who are directly affected. And so I am uh, very comfortable with the decision, and I think that the Board of Variance has worked well. Uh, without that third-party appeal, it's a place where the public can go and has gone repeatedly to find relief from decisions, and they get it. But it's not a place for everybody to come in and quarrel with each other about what has happened in a particular decision. So it's a longer story, and Terry, you've been deeply involved in it, and we haven't heard a peep about it since uh, we made that decision. That's funny because I have, and uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I don't support uh, that decision. I think the... Um, uh, uh, what NPA policies do you support? I, I, that's a good question. You, you can keep asking that, Councilor. Terry Martin with the questioner. And, anyway, I, um, uh, my, I, I uh, don't know the, the details, but I have, uh, I have looked into the, the this question uh, on a preliminary basis, and my understanding is that there are that, that the problem with this was a, is is, the, is in the legislation. The third party appeal thing, and there was a, a court uh, a case that that basically threw it out. I, um, I, I'm not totally up to date on it, and I will find out more if once I'm elected about it. And I do intend to follow up on it. I think that the, the idea of third parties being able to express themselves in a situation that can directly affect them because of a, a, of a, a board variance decision is essential. That, that their voices need to be heard whether it's, it's causing uh, unpleasant conversations between neighbors or not, it's got to be heard. Conversations are important in the city. Thank you. Okay, uh, other candidates that want to address this question? Elizabeth? Yeah, the third party appeals in the board, to the, through the Board of Variance was something that was allowed for 50 years and, and certainly the precedent was there as to that was how the charter was interpreted and there are legal opinions that feel that the the court case that threw it out was was actually erroneous and the city should not have acted the way they did in in the, with the legal department not supporting the public interest by ensuring that that um, got appealed after it was passed, and instead there really wasn't enough um, support for 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 overturning it. But certainly the city could easily, just with a stroke of a pen, request that of the of the province. And it was an extremely important process. It is something that that creates the checks and balances when you have a very um, conditional zoning is is a big part of how. Uh, the city of Vancouver does its zoning and it gives a tremendous amount of power to the director of planning and the third party appeals was a way to balance that power so that, that parties, third parties that were affected by a discretionary decision of the director of planning had, had a way to go without having to go through an expensive court case. Now, the only way that a third party can appeal anything is to actually take it to court, and it's extremely expensive, so it won't happen. So it's unfair to the public interest. Thank you. Okay, is there maybe one other candidate that would like to address it, or we can move on to the next uh, question? Okay, we'll move on to the next question. Hi, uh, my name is Gordon. Well, so look, and, uh, I'm a long-term resident of Mount Pleasant and uh, actually a member of uh, RAMP. Uh, a friend of mine actually has recently moved to Vancouver uh, and he, he makes around $35,000, $40,000 a year gross. Uh, he's really stressed actually, he's looking for rental accommodation, he's really, really stressed about it. And um, 
It seems like previous uh, councils have failed uh, to, they, you always hear this word affordable, uh, but nothing seems to be affordable. And Ellen Woodsworth brought up a few interesting ideas, um, and I'd like to, her to elaborate on it and also talk about what to the council we need going forward to implement some of these ideas. So I'd like you to elaborate on, on what you talked about, affordable rental accommodation, but also what to the council do we actually need going forward? To, you know, who can we actually vote for to implement some of these ideas? And if anybody else has, wants to talk about it, uh, I feel free. Well, um, as I said, I, I've been a renter for 32 years in Grandview Woodlands, and uh, my landlord took me to the Rentalism Board to ask for a 36% rent increase, and I used some of the tenants from the West End who were part of the rent eviction group that fought Hollywood, and we were able to win that, and a week later, I discovered that our row house complex was up for sale, and last week I discovered it had been sold. So. I'm very conscious that 51% of the people in the city are renters and they're extremely vulnerable. There's a number of things we need to do. I think we, in turn, we, we need the Residential Tenancy Board to set up an office in Vancouver so people have, don't have to go to Burnaby to fight uh, evictions and to deal with landlords. We need to strengthen the support for uh, tenants, and I think tenant organizations, especially in the downtown east side, we need to uh, strengthen the staff that are dealing with landlords uh, around the city to make sure they keep their buildings up to proper standards. Our staff are, are extremely stretched, and it's difficult for them to enforce a lot of the bylaws that we do have just because they're so stretched. Um, I think that we do need a city housing authority so that we can buy up land and, and work with groups to uh, develop housing on it. And I, we are the only uh, G8 country without a national housing plan. And we need to support uh, Libby Davies Bill 304 because we need the federal and provincial governments really to come back to provide for us with a multiple form of housing. And finally, we need a ward system so that people can elect people from their areas and then five people at large who would be our GBRB reps. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go with uh, Heather and then Adrian and then RJ if you want to Sure, thanks, thanks very much. I, I think that a Cope Vision Council is your way to make sure that we're paying attention to renters. It's been very clear that uh, Suzanne is not, uh, does not think that the city needs to concern itself with renters. Some of the things that we're working on, uh, as Ellen has said, is, are these issues about the renovations. We've taken a very strong stand. I'm proud of this council for the work that we've done to help the people who are getting renovated. We've also taken a stand with the Standards and Maintenance Bylaw, which allows us to go into uh, the SROs in the downtown east side and demand that the, that the um, owner bring them up to basic safety codes, and we can charge them back, we can have the work done and charge them back if they don't do it. We've just done that, including bringing in protections for the people who are in those buildings who were afraid that they were going to be evicted for speaking to council. We, uh, we had them upstairs where they were off the cameras. So we've gone to extraordinary lengths to help renters. But there are some other things we can do as well along the affordability line. Affordability doesn't necessarily mean subsidized. We don't have the cash as a city to do subsidization. We absolutely are going to the federal government and supporting Libby's bill. I was very proud to be part of a group of 120 uh, elected officials from across the country from the FCM, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, who went and spoke with a single voice representing over 90% of the population of Canada went to Ottawa, went to Parliament Hill and said, we must get this bill passed, we must have a national housing plan. But we can also do some other things around affordability, they're challenging, but we can work with Habitat for Humanity, we've got our first Habitat project in the city uh, being built right now, and we can continue to work with co-ops, we've got our first co-op in the building in many, many years here in the city being built right now, or being developed right now. So those are some of the other tools that we have. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention rent banks, but... Okay, thank you. Uh, Adrian? Yeah, the, this is a huge challenge and it's not an easy one to solve. That's why it's going to take real creativity and collaboration. So the kind of counsel you need are people who are willing to drop party barriers and work cooperatively with the good ideas that come forward. It's absolutely essential. We need a really uh, a, a council that will work well together and, and uh, not care who raised the idea, let's just explore them and see which one is the best. 
Now, um, in terms of affordable housing, and especially rental housing, um, I did raise, during the earlier part of the evening, the, the uh, idea of the federal tax. Until 1988, when that tax was in place, we had rental housing being built, intentional rental housing. Since that tax um, law was changed, and in fact what it did was then reward condo investors, believe it or not, um, it, we have not had virtually any rental housing built in this city or across Canada. So I've talked to people within the development community and they've said pretty universally, if that tax law was in place and if it was in fact expanded because one of the barriers for investors in rental housing is that the cost of maintaining rental housing over time is also quite prohibitive, especially if you compare it to building and selling condos. So um, if it was changed to add a clause around um, a write-off for ongoing maintenance, repairs, and upgrading of rental housing, it would be an attractive thing, and I think that's why we need to pursue it. Well, I, I don't have much to add because Ellen covered a lot of the, uh, of the points that uh, COPA stood for and still stands for, and, and she's added rent banks as a, as a measure for people who won't be able to afford rent for one week. It's a, it's a temporary measure. It's not you know meant to uh, as, as a long-term thing. It's, it, it's meant to help somebody get past that one month where they're not able to pay their rent. Uh, affordable housing, and I mentioned earlier, inclusionary zoning is one tool where we can uh, make sure that we're providing more affordable housing to when there's new developments being built in the city. And uh, the kind of council that we need is the kind of council that has, uh, I mean, COPE has, has a long tradition for fighting for these types of initiatives and listening to neighborhoods. And, you know, I, what, as Ellen said, wards is an important thing so that we have people from the neighborhoods being heard, having their voices heard, being represented at, at the municipal level. Some other hands raised, but uh, we've had more uh, candidates answer the question, so I'd like to move on to the next uh, question at this point. So, everybody has a chance to ask a question. My name is Jean Campbell, I'm a resident of Mount Pleasant, and um, over the years, you've had quite a few uh, public consultations with the residents of Mount Pleasant about the Mount Pleasant Outdoor Swimming Pool, and we have let Park Board know and City Council know overwhelmingly that we want and we need that outdoor swimming pool. We are tired of the excuses. It was promised to us, land was set aside for it, and now the promise is broken, and we are told we are never getting that pool. Well, votes count. This is crunch time. I would like everybody on the podium, yes or no, do you support the Mount Pleasant Outdoor Swimming Pool? Okay, so let's yes just no. do uh, 15 second answers from everybody on the podium. Of course I support the Mount Pleasant Pool, but it's a Parks Board decision and they have to decide how to spend their budgets and that's the critical question here. Yes, I support it, as does our Green Parks Board Commissioner, Stuart McKinney. I support the Park Board decision on it, and uh, they decided they couldn't afford it, so it's not there now. You'll, you'll recall I made a proposal earlier tonight, and I think it's entirely doable. Uh, we, can, we can have that pool uh, uh, in, in a, a very short order, uh, back, functioning back in the community, and I have consulted my fellow uh, NPA Park uh, Commissioner candidates. They are fully in support of it and very enthusiastic and we're looking forward to working with you to get that pool. Thank you. Thank you. NSD is running uh, five candidates for council, including a mayor. And uh, if we were elected, I think the council actually does have a lot of authority in, in this regard. I don't think you can just pass it on to the parks board because we are in control of the capital plan. And I think if we really want to make this happen, we can make it happen. And I don't think everything should be tied to development, that you have to get a certain amount of development before you build amenities. Many of the neighborhoods are underserved by, by amenities, and they just need them. They, we shouldn't have to wait till we put in big towers to, uh, to do this. Thank you.
Thank you. Having been a park board commissioner, I fully support the autonomy of the park board, and I am not going to try to overturn a decision that they made. Okay. No pull, no vote. The autonomy of the park board. No pull, no vote. Uh, speaking of the autonomy of the park board, you now have a choice between uh, NPA park board that would like to work with you on the project or a vision park board that doesn't. And I support it and I've actually shared it with my social networks to spread the word because I think it's a worthwhile cause. I personally don't have the history or background on it. I'd like to know more. Um, I, I think every community deserves to have these amenities. Um, and I'd like to know more on how the park board can work and, and how uh, yeah, those decisions are made. So I'd like to hear from you afterwards. Thank you. Great, thank you. No pool, no vote. <laughs> vote green. Okay. Let's entertain the next uh, question. Hi, my name is Paulette Cayem. I'm from the West End. And um, I, I, to reflect what uh, the, president, the person was saying, we, we have a very uh, limited uh, uh, library facility in the West End. It's, uh, it's ridiculously inadequate for the population and the importance, I think, of this neighborhood as well as uh, we have no uh, meeting place. The, the WEMAC was always giving us an excuse for not meeting in the West and in the neighborhood that there was no room, no adequate room for us, can you imagine? So that was, uh, it's incredible. And yet, uh, the, uh, with, with STIR, the way I understand it, is that uh, you, uh, the STIR uh, forgoes the CACs and DCLs which would uh, allow for such uh, improvements uh, in the neighborhood to, to occur much, much easier. So the, the money for, for these amenities is for none, and, um, and I find that it's uh, at the detriment of the, uh, uh, you know, at, uh, at the detriment of the uh, local uh, neighborhoods. So and and your for, question. my question is that uh, who uh, among you would do without, uh, promised to do without STIR, uh, which I think is, uh, is uh, an incredible advantage to the uh, rich developers and at the detriment of the 99% uh, tax, uh, taxpayers who do pay their fair share of the tax burden already, and I think, uh, I think that uh, so I, will not, I will not vote for anybody is it, is who is closer. Question? The question is, who among you is uh, ready to promise that you will completely do without the STIR program? Uh, okay, I, I think I that most of the candidates, uh, RJ, did you want to address it? That was something that was asked uh, earlier. Uh, if you want to address it, or we can move on. Oh, I, was, I concur with uh, Ellen's answer earlier. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I, mean, I think it's a question that's been answered in a fair amount of detail because it was one of our uh, five questions. Yes. Well, oh. can we show hands? I'm against it. Against it. Current yes. form against it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And against. Okay. Our next uh, question, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Marjorie with the Vancouver Society for Promotion of Outdoor Pools. And as you know, Mount Pleasant Pool was demolished in 2010 uh, with the development, redevelopment of the park. This um, thought about being responsive to the community and having dialogue. Uh, there was the, the, the community has been canvassed. There has been extensive public consultation at the taxpayer's expense in which over 81% favor the replacement of the pool above any other feature in this park. Now, of course, the park is being developed with every feature but the pool. Uh, the pool is, however, in the master plan, and I believe that under the City of Vancouver's um, the, the 10 year strategy, there is a category for replacement of assets. Can you just clarify the question one more time? Sure. There is, uh, in, the, in the city's 10-year strategy, replacement of assets is, a, or in the capital plan, replacement of assets is a part of that. And the council does a lot the, the money, the, the parcel of money that park board is given. And being that we have gone through all of this public consultation, it's in the park master plan, what isn't there is, is the money. And yes, right now, not a park board that favors the replacement of the pool, unfortunately, despite all of the public consultation and promises of being responsive to public consultation. Uh, we've done our due diligence. 
the community has spoken. What will you do if you're elected to make sure that Park Board gets enough money in the capital plan or through other dialogues that you have with other levels of government to ensure that there is money for the replacement of this facility, which this community or any community can, cannot afford to lose a very valuable recreational facility. Well, I think part of what you're addressing is uh, the actual Park Board's loss of autonomy under the current uh, mayor and council. And I think city councillors need to be outspoken to support this outdoor pool and to make sure that Park Board commissioners have the funding. And as Bill said, uh, our Park Board commissioners are more than happy to support this project. And as a city councillor, if I was elected, I would also push to make sure that you have the resources needed to get that pool. It's been promised to you. It's, that would be it. Okay, I believe I designated uh, Ellen. As a city councillor, I can certainly support the recommendations from Parks Board when they come before us. And I have to respect that. I live in Grandview Woodlands. The Britannia Pool needs to be replaced. Uh, Templeton Pool is in rough shape. I have to respect the, what comes to the City Council from the Parks Board. The Parks Board is the, just about the only elected Parks Board in North America. So we need to respect what the Parks Board presents us with. I think the Parks Board need more money. There's no question about that. And they might make a different decision if they had more money. I certainly think they would make a different decision if they had more money. The only place I see them getting more money is we stop the tax shift from business to residential, which either then gets added to the tax base or gets cut from our spending, about $10 million a year. So I'm completely opposed to the tax shift, and if that gave us, if we could get agreement on council on that, we haven't had agreement, it's something that the NPA set up, and it's uh, got one, one more year to go, but that's about $50 million out the window that we could have had so that we could have given more money to the Parks Board. But I cannot say, in all honesty, as a councillor running at large, that I can prioritize one over the other. Parks Board makes a decision on which community centre is next in line, which pool is next in line. They have to make that decision. They're the professionals. They are elected by all of us to make those decisions and then they bring us their budget and, and we go from there. I think our new city manager, the Parks Board manager, Malcolm Brown, is entirely competent. I'm so very uh, So, Jeff? Well, I agree with Ellen. And we go around the city during this campaign and every single neighborhood has a deficit it wants paid for. And we cannot, I'm not going to come to this meeting and say anything other than if the Parks Board prioritizes that for their constitutional support the Parks Board recommendation. I don't want this discussion to miss the fact that the Hillcrest Pool and Rink Complex, which is huge, was the was the source of massive overruns under the NPA administration, which would have paid for the Queen Elizabeth Conservatory roof and a couple of other outdoor pools and many other things. So, you know, we just can't come in and say, okay, we've got to have the pool. This is the is the hill we're going to die on. I got to be honest with you, I get a lot of requests citywide for very very legitimate expenditures and we weigh them all and in the case of park board amenities the park board does the prioritizing and we vote on that plan. <laughs> okay Adrian you're good for my answer and then I'm gonna have to cut this question off there because we're running behind. Great first of all let me tell you that I grew up in Vancouver was born here and I just live in an outdoor pool. Um, our parks board commission the green park board commissioner voted in support of the pool. Um, and, and replacement of that pool. Um, I don't think it's just a matter of money because I did a little digging on this issue and I uh, found that there was a, there's an attitude there or a, maybe a set of decisions even that say that there are engineering difficulties um, in maintaining outdoor pools. I disagree with that. I disagree with that because I look at other cities around Canada and they have a very high ratio and ongoing investment in outdoor pools. I don't think that it's, it can't be a sanitary and safety and health issue for us, but not for Winnipeg or Toronto or Montreal. So um, I'm absolutely, I, I would support the Green Parks Board Commissioner on Council by doing the investigation into where the barriers are um, so that we can actually move on. I think they're a huge asset to the quality of life of our neighborhoods and our children. Okay, thank you.
have uh, four more people standing. We're going to take one more question. I'm going to limit this uh, question to two responders. Just to uh, make one note here, the question should be on planning policy. <laughs> so, and uh, if we can get answers from Elizabeth and uh, Bill this time. Hi, my name is Annabelle Vaughn. I've been part of the uh, Mount Pleasant community group uh, that put forward a dynamic and progressive community plan that dealt with issues of growth, architectural innovation, and cultural sustainability. It is people who build communities and cities, and developers who profit off of us. Your job as councillors is to stand up for us and to give our communities a voice and power at the table. Currently, the power planning pro process is backwards, with developers driving the process over the heads of communities what concrete measures will you put in place to put communities in front of the process to ensure that our goals and visions are achieved? Thank you very much for that question. I totally agree with you. I think that the process is completely broken and, and special interests are being allowed to override community voice so that the plans either don't end up reflecting what was the information that was given forward in, in the planning process, or else it's ignored. And I think that that is a huge problem. And essentially what we would do if NSV is, is elected is certainly change that process and change the terms of reference that, that these plans are both uh, completed under and also implemented with. So I, I think that, um, it, that the community needs to be involved much earlier in uh, when spot rezonings come forward, or, uh, rezoning proposals come forward, and if there isn't... Like, like at the beginning. Yes, exactly. And, and if that is not supported by the community, uh, they, they shouldn't be dragged through a long process that just keeps trying to manufacture consent. Thank you. Okay, I, I have... Concrete uh, measures, not just listening, because actually Ellen and Adrian are the only people who have actually put concrete measures, and Elizabeth, you just did. So, concrete, listening is one thing, but it's actually putting something in place, like area councils, or... All right, how long have you got? How long have I got? I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got a four-page proposal here. You could be, uh, you're welcome to read after this if you like. I have uh, on, on how, seconds how I, <laughs> 15 seconds per page. I and so how I, I intend to change the planning process, the neighborhood planning and consultation process in Vancouver to make neighbors, neighborhoods' voices heard and, in fact, neighbors creating their own neighborhoods, not the planning department doing it. The planning department should be assisting the neighborhoods to do their planning, not the other way around. My name is Michelle Storino and I'm with RAM, but I'm also speaking as a resident in Mount Pleasant. My first quick question is, Councillor Woodsworth, why are you not running for mayor, please? Um, you'd be very happy. Uh, my next question, uh, with getting involved with RAM, one thing that's stuck out dramatically is small business. It's being extremely threatened. Uh, I know people that have to close their doors because they simply cannot afford to. Uh, business taxes are ridiculous. The amount of permits, the amount of restrictions. Uh, it's affecting Main Street dramatically. It's affecting Mount Pleasant dramatically. Landlords are getting scared based on speculation and the current talk about the developers coming into this area. And a lot of small businesses are being jacked up to 50% and more on their rents. What would any of you do 
being elected members to stop this and to protect small business owners because they're very detrimental to the city. Okay. Uh, Ellen, would you want to answer that question? <laughs> Um, I, I have put through a motion in, when I was in the previous incarnation of, of myself in 2002-2005 that s small business owners sh shouldn't be paying the same tax rate as large business owners. <laughs> flat, flat taxes always work to the benefit of the, the people who have the most. Um, I also have, I have, was talking with people in Quebec and Montreal in particular, and they have some vehicle to protect small businesses by protecting an area. Our planners have said there's no way they can do that, but I want to follow up with what's happening in Montreal and see if there's some way we can protect small businesses. None of us want to go the way Robson Street went. I mean, I'm concerned about Main Street, I'm concerned about Hastings, I'm concerned about Commercial Drive. The big, com the big stores come in, the chain stores come in, gap, people like that, and the little guys get forced out, heritage is lost, and it's just appalling. Um, one thing that I think we could do is we could do development so that there'd be, uh, resi there'd be retail on the ground floor and build a couple of floors of housing on top of it. So I think that's one thing we're working on, on and I think that um, the Ms. Vaughn, was just at the table, had some interesting ideas in terms of Kingsway, and we're trying to do that in some areas, and I think we need to do more of that to protect the small business owner, because trickle-down economics don't work, and you guys aren't getting the benefits of the tax break that the businesses are, getting, are being given, because the landlords don't give, it, give you that break, and I think that we need to make sure that that break does come through. But if you've got any ideas, if anybody's heard of other, what other okay, cities are doing, I'd like to hear. Uh, then we're going to have uh, Heather and followed by Jason. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Um, the tax shift that was referred to earlier was brought forward after an independent third-party review of our tax system. And I don't have time to explain the whole ratio issue, but in fact it's not creating a difference in the amount of tax that's collected, it's reallocating it. And it was done because we are in, in fear of losing our small businesses. Uh, over 80% of the businesses in Vancouver employ less than 20 people. We are a city of entrepreneurs. We are a city of, of small businesses. The land value, again, is a challenge here. We can't force a private landowner not to tell someone they can't have their job, their, their store there anymore. What we can do is uh, work with the businesses and things like our car-free days to promote neighborhoods, to promote the strength of the small businesses. Fourth Avenue is trying really hard to do that, but uh, we have a certain limited window tools. Dressing, it's something concrete, that's window dressing. Well, and, and we have limited tools. That's one of the things you have to come into account of when you're elected, is that you use the tools that you have. So we've looked at the differential taxes for large and small businesses. And in fact, it, first of all, because we are almost all small businesses, it wouldn't have the same, uh, there wouldn't be much of a difference we could do and still collect the taxes we need to pay for the things in the city that we do. Uh, we've looked at that technically and we haven't been able to solve it because we have a different charter than the rest of the province. But it's an issue we're very conscious of. We're very supportive of small businesses. We're putting together some people at City Hall who are specifically working with small businesses. And the issue of extra regulations is something we take very seriously. And certainly in the cultural facilities, we're working very hard to cut all that regulation right now down to the bare minimum. Okay, I know there are other people that want to respond, but we're uh, past 940, so I want to move this along. So let's go on to the next. Oh, sorry, can I just add to that? Because I actually, oh, just briefly. Okay. You know, you've you asked such an important question. And I think a lot of people, I, I actually agree with Ellen on most things, but I don't agree with her on this one. Because, in fact, what happens is a small business, is at the vast majority, nine, over 95%, do not own the land, they rent. And the full cost of increased taxes get pushed onto them by triple net. So they are moved, the, the lands have escalated in value, the, the taxes have gone up, and our small businesses get paid it all in their rent, triple net, and they can't make it anymore. And that's why they're shutting down. And I think it's a huge concern for every single one of us in this room when we lose the independent small businesses. So I do a, a, a support the redressing of inequity and so the, in terms of the tax shift um, that, uh, that, that, would remove, that would reduce it on the, on the, the business taxes because of, um, because of that concern around small businesses. We need to pay attention. Okay, I see a lot of uh, passion on this one. I'm going to ask Jason to do it, and then we need to move on. 
Thanks so much. Um, so my background, I'm actually a small business banker, and I've literally spoken to thousands of entrepreneurs and businesses in the city of Vancouver. And I can tell you, small business does not have a voice in City Hall right now. Um, with property tax shifts, we have a ratio that is just astronomical. They're paying upwards of 4.5 uh, times more property tax than a residential property. And the NPA initiated a shift to bring it back in alignment when we were last in power. And uh, Vision has supported that, so kudos to them. But uh, should we be elected, I would be furthering that again and bringing it closer into alignment. Other cities have a ratio of around 2.5 or whatever. It, it's completely prohibitive. And when you look at the cost of what that means to you, it means what's the cost to you of having a local grocer in your neighborhood? It, it, does that have value to you? To bring this ratio in alignment with the region, you're looking at paying upwards of maybe $36 a year to keep that local business there and to keep those things competitive in Vancouver. Another big problem is with respect to fees. And as small entrepreneurs in the city know, people that run a business on the side because it's their passion, because they love it, uh, the fees that they're being charged are completely prohibitive. Um, I know dog walkers are being charged based on how many dogs they're walking. It's, we have to encourage people to uh, start these entrepreneurial businesses and also to encourage the tax shift that's gonna keep business here because what we've seen is we're bleeding businesses. Reports have just come out showing that we are not, um, we are not growing our business stock in Vancouver and that's a really dangerous sign because we need a sustainable economy to be a sustainable city. Okay, thank you Jason. Okay, let's move on to the next question, Sandy. Hi, I'm Sandy and I'm Councillor Deal. This is just a question for you. Um, you Correct me if I'm wrong, but you had mentioned it's important to have density near a transit house. Yeah. So I'm curious um, why it can be in Broadway where the rapid transit is, is why there wasn't any height density added on top of that. Thank you. Um, that land actually isn't the city's land, um, it's Translink's land. And uh, in the places where we have control over that land, such as Marine and, and Canby, and in the zoning along Canby, we have made those decisions where we have the power to do so. Okay, so if it's Translink's land. So there you have it. That's the kind of place. Okay, thank you. And the last question. The last question. Okay. My name is Jean Dier and uh, this is in Vancouver. It's a beautiful city. We come from far away to be in Vancouver, and we love Vancouver. We have a lot of challenges in Vancouver, and everywhere I go. In Vancouver, I see a black man begging, begging, and from far away. We are not enjoying the beautiful of this city. Myself, I don't have a question. I want to ask you a request. If you guys were elected, can you go to the city hall? You put aside a small money, $100,000. Specifically, specifically for Africans, black people who live in Vancouver, and create a force task to learn and to tell the city of Vancouver the issues of the people, especially black people who live in Vancouver, they are facing right now. That's my request. Okay, so I think I'm going to open that up to everybody. Let's just uh, start the time with the bell. And uh, any candidate, I wish they would just go in order, starting with that one. Uh, certainly, if we can declare February Black History Month, and if we can uh, set up the Mayor's Task Force on Immigration that has uh, addressed some of these, and if we can join the Canadian Coalition of Municipalities Against Racism and Discrimination, and if we can set up a, a tremendous project called Citizen U to train 2,000 youth in anti-racist, anti-discrimination activities, we can certainly look at the proposal you're making and figure out how to get that round table going. But I know that, that the issues that you're raising have been raised in all those different groups that I just referred to that we have gotten up and running and and I think I hope people know about Citizen U. It's just an amazing project to bring 2,000 youth in anti-racist and discrimination uh, initiatives and 
I know that there's a tremendous amount of racism, and as the economy gets worse, there's more racism, and we need to stop it, and we need to stand firm, and understand the different nature of racism towards different communities. So thank you, Jean, for bringing this question, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to be at your candidate's meeting earlier today. today. Yeah, your, your, um, your proposal does have merit, and uh, I was at your meeting earlier, but I wasn't able to stay for, for the fact that I had to come here on time. Um, and your proposal has merit because we are a multicultural city, we are a city of great wealth, and we are a city of great disparities. Um, and uh, I've worked for years in the downtown east side area, that's where my offices have been, and, uh, and so it's... it's um, it hurts me every time I see people begging daily on the streets. The fact that we don't have affordable housing, the fact that we do have discrimination still in the city and that we don't have equity in terms of employment um, and, and the right to, uh, to safe, clean, affordable housing. Um, so the idea is a good one, how to implement it. Boy, I'll have to, uh, you know, hopefully I will be elected and at that point work with you and towards seeing uh, through some of the programs that Alan's mentioned how, how something like that can get implemented. I have nothing to add. It's a very solid idea, but I'm not sure where the funding comes from. I'd love to see a specific proposal, but we would certainly look at it very carefully. Yes, we, we, met, we, we met the proposal to the committee services. Right now, it's in there. So we want them, if they approve it, or they deny it, to city council here, what you guys can do for us. We need, we need it, your help, and it is all of us. Even if we claim it is an inclusive society, it's really break. It's hard to break. It's really very sad. We need to do something. Okay. Uh, I, um, I, I'd like to uh, uh, echo the uh, previous speaker's uh, uh, sentiments in terms of uh, making it very clear that uh, Vancouver and Canada in general is, we are trying to be an inclusive society. I think we've had considerable success. We still have a long way to go. And we, we want to include all people uh, from any, everywhere in the, in the world have come to live here. We want you all to live well, comfortably, happily, and prosper, and prosper while you're here. There are many challenges, I know. I've, I've worked uh, in my own architectural practice over the years, hiring people when you, you and, and you know, it didn't matter where they came from the world. You, you, you know, it's a difficult process. I've also had some experience recently with there's some provincial and federal um, programs that are here and functioning in Vancouver that are of great help to immigrants. I don't think they're well enough known. They can give people, the, the kind of people you're talking about, a great deal of assistance. They can find jobs for them. That's their whole purpose, uh, or their primary purpose. So um, if uh, we, we need to, to speak further, and I, as Councilor Max has said, we, I'd, I'd love to look at your proposal and, and uh, let's consider it. The issues to say that, uh, we're actually kind of into my along. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, NSB definitely supports inclusive policies that, that uh, do make the, um, like I don't know the exact specifics of your proposal, but it sounds reasonable and uh, I think we would have to look at these things. And uh, I think that also, the issues that, a lot of the issues that were raised earlier uh, that affect uh, affordability and, and housing and all these issues affect the um, uh, newer immigrant population a great deal. So I think that we need to, to address all these issues and, and include the immigrant populations. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm proud that uh, the Vision and Cope uh, councillors and Park Board Commissioners and School Board Trustees have a very strong record on this. We have brought in a lot of measures, whether it's uh, uh, Little Saigon, which is to support the small businesses owned by Vietnamese immigrants, whether it's our immigrant training program, mentoring program in the city of Vancouver, where professionals work with people who come from other countries to come get up to speed in their own profession here, whether it's working with urban Aboriginal people in downtown East Side, we're just putting forward a huge new program there whether it's working with Philippine nannies who've come here and are dealing with some very severe problems. I think uh, we have a strong record. I'm very interested in seeing your proposal and, and hopefully we'll see that in the new year. Thank you. I definitely appreciate your question and thank you for posing it today. Um, 
the dynamic that you're speaking of really, I think, uh, transcends race, and uh, I think we need to look at this as uh, what strategies can we put forward to help everyone in our city that needs assistance, and to make sure that we have uh, faster processes to get people from the street into homes and then uh, into long-term housing. Uh, I speak from experience. My father actually was caught in the downtown east side for a brief moment and is transitioning from the Burnaby Center to housing downtown. And uh, it is a painful process, uh, not just to see someone you don't know, but to have someone close to you go through that. And uh, I'm very much committed to taking this issue seriously and to working with people in the downtown east side to address the situation for yourself and uh, for new immigrants in Canada, but also really for everyone that lives here because it's it's unacceptable, and we do need to start working more seriously with senior levels of government to open a mental health facility in BC near Vancouver because that really strikes to the core of a lot of our issues is these concurrent disorders. We don't have the tools right now to effectively manage them. John, how are you doing? Good, yeah. Uh, uh, John and I, I was at the uh, debate earlier and John asked the same question and, and, and my response was uh, well, we need to open up and, and, and listen to, to this community's desires. We need to engage in a dialogue and make sure that their concerns are heard and that we need to act in a way to encourage them to, to continue to talk to us. We need to uh, listen, act, and then, so that they're, they're, they still will continue to talk to us and it will it'll be an ongoing dialogue. So, yes, uh, it is something that, uh, and, well, Ellen takes up all the good answers, so we support it. Okay, well, I think that's a great question and some great responses to end the evening on. And uh, ooh, we're just a few minutes before 10, so I want to thank everybody for sticking around this long. And uh, it's just really great to see this good, uh, nice a turnout. I, I believe this may be the largest uh, turnout so far. Uh, okay, so do you want me to read that? Maybe? Say something about it. <laughs> okay, I don't even know what that means, actually. <laughs> okay. I just want to, I just want to say a quick thank you to everybody in the audience. I, um, I took a very old set of water bottles, plastic water bottles, and put them on the table over there before you got to the uh, filtered city water. You all took the filtered city water. Thank you. Ah. Okay, now I understand. So Randy wrote that up here about three hours ago, and I'm kind of looking at that saying, what does that mean? Now I know. So, uh, but anyway, I'm really glad that we got such a great turnout, and I, I want to encourage everybody to remain uh, as engaged and as active in this election as possible, because I think that makes a difference.